anything. We're not going to end a war uh, of forward adventure. We're not going to fix climate change. We're not going to fix the problems that we have with poverty in this country. It's just not. I mean, it's just not on the table right now. And until we can make sure that our voices are heard by being on the streets and being in their faces and making them finally take us seriously, that's how we're going to make this, this system change and that's how we're going to start making progress on the other issues that are all very important to us. Yeah, I just want to say as a sustainable agriculture student, <laughs> it's uh, very frustrating to learn about these things every day in class and know that if there aren't these changes systematically, it's not going to happen. We have the solutions. We have so many alternatives to how we can actually make things work sustainably. But unless we change the political system, the, the economic system, it's just we can't apply these changes. They just don't fit together in the same platform. So. I want to say something, but I'm gonna totally butcher this. I, I like this this this, this uh, example because I just read it recently and I kind of glanced over it. And I wish I had read it more in detail, uh, but it was really important. It's really important. You should read more um, uh, about the Keystone Pipeline and how it stopped and and Bill McKibben and there's an article that talked about. I guess it criticized a previous article that said that. No, this is Occupy's chance to really make a difference. But you know, in actuality, there's evidence because Bill McKibben, who was helping to lead this this effort, actually called the Occupy movement in Washington D.C. to help with the protest, to come and gather in in solidarity with the Keystone Pipeline, and it amplified the numbers so greatly that it raised attention. And so perhaps um, you know, and, and it's hard to you know, that's just one example of not necessarily the Occupy movement itself focusing on an environmental concern, but the Occupy movement as a broader issue, or a broader movement, helping these, these, these more focused movements. Um, and maybe that's where Occupy's future, that's right now where Occupy is, is not necessarily focusing on these smaller issues, but being the foundation for these smaller issues to move forward. The Grand Coalition. <laughs> yes. Because because I know that everybody in Occupy, not everybody, but majority of Occupy, people within the Occupy movement, I'm sure agree with you. So, I mean, that's, that's you know, and it's, it's also dangerous, you know, as we all know, to focus on one thing. Uh, I'm trying to get a better sense of your vision for success. Um, you know, there was a brief discussion earlier about the you know the counterculture movement of the 60s and 70s, and um, you know I think for everybody it was different, but I but as I recall, in a way, there it was in, in in many ways a similar type of thing, but we had a um, a on, on another level we had a very clear objective that on some level I think we knew was going to be attainable, which was to stop that war in Vietnam and to stop the provocation of the draft and the killing of people we directly knew. So there was a, a direct provocation and a sense that there was a limited goal that we somehow knew where we were going to get. We didn't know how soon, but we were going to get it. And then if I remember, my memory of the counterculture was, and there was this bigger issue, which was what we called the revolution. And um, I think in, a, in some ways, what I experience, what you guys are doing now, is is kind of that. I mean, I, I find you a little bit boggling because, um, you know, taking on what you're taking on is was kind of like the bigger picture, and the realities that that you're dealing with now are realities that we really weren't dealing with yet. There was still much more to go around. The um, industrial military complex was not as codified. The the corporate world had not become as aggressive. Had not you know that things weren't. There was a lot more leeway when I was young, and now the rubber's kind of hitting the road. In my perception of what we would have called the revolution, it's like now you're dealing with that, and I'm having a lot of trouble understanding what your vision is for success here. 
you know, and, and I assume it's kind of probably an individual thing based on how this movement is operating. So I'm curious what, what you are seeing is, is, I mean, is it just simply um, showing up to speak up? Is that at this point the vision of success and, and creating a, um, an activity that says speak up? Or is there a, do you really on an individual level have a, a larger vision of success? You say you're in for the long haul. What is that vision, that long-term vision for success? Because it, it's got to be more than just a protest. Okay. I love what you're saying because it makes a lot of sense to me and it, it, I connect a lot with um, your, the boggling aspect of it because, well, when I was in New York, I worked on the Visions and Goals Working Group. So I went into that in the first day thinking, wow, I'm going to find out what the Visions and Goals of this movement are. No, I found out what our immediate visions and goals were. What we were working on that week was to, uh, to create a global conversation among all occupations. And then from that point, then we were planning on making our next vision and goal. You know what I mean? And it's just like um, in, in terms of like what we're doing today and how it connects to all of the movements that have come before us, we are just taking it one step at a time. And as an individual, I can tell you absolutely what I feel like my long-term vision and goal is for this movement. But I guarantee you it's not going to directly correspond with everybody else up here on this So, panel. So what is your vision for success here? My personal vision? Yeah. Okay, this is an I statement because Occupy Des Moines is very concerned with I and we statements. So an I statement, right, is uh, Danielle knows. Um, I've got myself in this control. Um, oh, that's, that's cool. And I, and I, speaking as my, just for myself, um, I am I'm a Marxist. So I see, I envision a utopian society. A true Marxist. Not a Lenin, Stalin. Okay. A true Marxist. Right. Um, and so I really do envision some, someday uh, uh, the revolution really coming to full fruition and us all being able to live in just communal society where we all give according to our ability. And you can see that. I do see that. I don't think it'll happen in my lifetime. But and you can <laughs> see, and you can see spending the rest of your life working towards that. Absolutely. So. And I, I, I think the other thing that you that you, you bring up a very good issue and, and what is what is the end game? And I don't think there is an end game at this point. Because right now what the larger Occupy movement is doing is changing the conversation. And we're already winning on that. Mm -hmm. um, if you look back at, I, I believe it's the Pew uh, research, the month before Occupy, the biggest word in the news was debt. It was debt, 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 debt. Far away beyond anything else. A month after Occupy started, jobs in the economy are the biggest things. So it, 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 it's not going to be, I don't see it personally as being, there's going to be this one watershed moment where everything comes together and, it, it, and we win. It's going to be a series of small victories, like the small victory that we're having in changing the conversation right now. It's going to be the small victory when everybody in this room is out on the streets with us uh, holding these banks and financial institutions and these campaign contributors accountable. Those are going to be the small victories that we're going to make for the larger victory that happens. It's going to be a transformative victory. It's not going to be, yay, we're going to go out, take the square, and, and be done. Mm -hmm. So you're not, I don't think you'll ever see this point that, yeah, I knew we were going to get here from, from, from where we were at. It's, it's going to be, oh, wow, we're here. How'd that happen? <laughs> so you're saying, you, for you, it's a vision of movement, of, I mean, of change. It's of, a vision of, of opening change, up. Yeah. Uh -huh. For me, it's not so much, I'm not looking so much in the long, long term. I, I maybe want to be a little more pragmatic and see how could we t take one step and how is that going to change. Um, I would really like to see the legal structure of corporations uh, changed. Yeah. And yes. I think just with that already, you will see a lot of changes and a lot of the issues that we want addressed um, could result. So. I think that would be maybe clear, you know, more direct to see maybe one thing at a time. And, uh, you know, I, I, for me it's really clear when, when you put it in terms, I think the current system, we have privatized gains and socialized costs. So if corporations really are people, they also need to be paying for the costs because everyone is. 
So, that.